2 Corinthians 12. What I, I was saying, there is a uh, documentary film out on Netflix. And <laughs> I'm sure you'll uh, probably see it show up on YouTube at some point. Somebody will copy it and put it on there. But it's a, it's they followed the flat earth crowd around for I don't know how many months. And it's amazing that these people were so eager to get their face on camera that, and I don't know how the film crew did it, but um, they must have made them feel very comfortable with their presence there because they actually tried some experiments to try to prove just how flat the earth was and that everybody's believed a lie all their life and so on. Their idea is, is that it's like this pizza shaped thing surrounded by this glass dome, which the Bible doesn't say anything about. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the idea is that the earth doesn't move at all. It doesn't rotate, it doesn't go, nothing, nothing like that. And there's different ways that you can prove it or not prove it. So I don't know how they did it, but somebody, somebody on the flat earth side coughed up a $20,000 gyroscope, a laser gyroscope that goes into these big commercial airplanes. Thinking that the gyroscope would not show the earth's movement. I want to know where the $20,000 could, because it's not like you can, once you're used it, you can sell it on eBay. Because who's, who goes into buying $20,000 gyroscopes on eBay? But anyway, the idea is if the earth is a globe and it turns once every 24 hours, then that measured out in hours is about a 15 degree turn every hour. So they set the gyroscope up and that's exactly what it showed was a 15 degree turn in an hour. And they went, whoops. So they actually had them on film discussing how they have to cover that up and not let that piece of information out because it proves them wrong. Yeah. So anyway, I've been saying that all along. The Bible doesn't teach it. Amen. You never read. Come on. You, you never read in the Bible that the earth is flat. Didn't read it. All right. Uh, that's part of 2 Corinthians 12. Discord. Seeds of discord. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon gave out, I think it's Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, seven things that are an abomination to God. And the, out of all the things that are an abomination to God, the seventh one, not at the end of the list because it's the least, I think it's the most prominent one, he that soweth discord among brethren. And what you'll find out, there is always somebody who is jealous of your friendship with somebody else. I mean, that stuff went on in high school. That stuff went on in grade school. But some people never grow out of it. And they always try, no matter, no matter who it is, they always try to break people apart for whatever justification they have. But that's, that's their purpose in it. And remember something that Jesus taught us, that our strength, or one of our strengths is, Jesus said, they shall know you by your love for one another. And he said, and when they accused Jesus of casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub, Jesus said, if a kingdom or a nation be divided or a house be divided against itself, it cannot stand. Now, one of the things that was always interesting to me was, is that in Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel was reading Nebuchadnezzar's dream and he had the four kingdoms, the fourth kingdom was part of iron and part of clay. 
Well, anybody with any kind of brain knows that if the foundation isn't solid, then the rest of the house is not solid. And so even though the foundation was part of iron, it was also partly made out of clay. And because of that, and he specifically says in Daniel chapter 2, it is divided against its, it is a house or a nation, a kingdom that is divided against itself. And we know then that that in part is what brings about its downfall. Because we see the stone cut without hands that comes and crushes the feet of that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw and it falls to the ground. So that's all of the kingdoms of the earth at the end of this age that are going to come tumbling down. And the devil then and his people will seek to try to break up people's relationships. I see it all the time. Uh, know that we have enemies that are against us. They don't like us because of what we believe. They don't like us because of who we are. And it's amazing that while there is a move to try to unite all of the religions of the world into one great melting pot, the exclusion is those who still believe the Bible to be the Word of God. They exclude us out of there because they know that we're not going to go along with what they say. So in 2 Corinthians 12, let's look in verse 20. Paul said, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would. Uh, or I would say, Paul would say, I've not found you as I left you. When I left you, you were in good shape. But now if I come back and visit you, I won't find that. But I shall, uh, and that I shall be found unto you as such as you would not, lest there be debates. And we started into this last Sunday morning. Lest there be debates and envyings. And we covered that. And wraths. And I don't think if I, I don't think I mentioned, uh, that too much, but wrath is someone who has an anger temperament. They have a very angry disposition. And it's one thing to be angry. It's not a sin to be angry. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. So it's not a sin to be angry. The Bible says be angry and sin not. So sometimes you can't help. Sometimes I can't help how I feel on any given moment. Uh, my wife and I, we don't always see eye to eye with between ourselves. I don't always agree with her. She doesn't always agree with me. Most of the time... We just don't bring it up. But sometimes I'll say something or sometimes she'll say something that I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like it when she said it or I didn't like how she said it uh, or I don't agree with her. And from time to time, because she said it, I'll be angry. And we made a deal years ago and it's still in place that if I didn't like something she said more than likely because I don't like to argue and everybody write that down Mike Hoggart does not like to argue so if you call here looking for an argument out of me I won't do it because I won't even argue with my wife and I love her but I just don't like to be on the phone with people arguing all the time. I just, I'll, I'll say what I, I say what I think. I say what I think the Bible says. And whether you like it or not, or whether you agree or not, it's really, I don't have any say in that. If you don't agree with it, don't agree with it. Move on. Go, go somewhere else. I just don't like to argue with people. I'm not a debater, but Every now and then I'll get, I'll get mad. I'll get angry. And so what I've tried to do over the years is not, I won't say not react to the anger because it's impossible to not react to anger. It's impossible. 
You can't cover that up. You can't hide it. But you can control how you react to it. Can you not? Now, I know with some people, there's, there's some deep-rooted things there. Has to be worked on. I get that. But for the most part, you do have a certain amount of control over what you do and what you say. And so, I promised my wife years ago that I would not argue back. I would not yell at her. I'd not try to belittle her. I would just keep my mouth shut. And if she sees me walk off, don't come chasing after me. Unless you want me to say it. Because if you want me to say it, I mean, it's there. But I'd rather not. And that, that's, that applies with a lot of situation with a lot of people. And so, I just don't like to carry out where my anger wants to take me. And that's where wrath comes in. You can be angry at people. You can disagree with people. But some people want to inflict harm on others because of that anger, or because of that disagreement. They want to act out on that. They want to say things that are mean, deliberately mean. And not just truthful, mean. Trying to hurt that person with words or with actions. That's wrath. You've made a judgment about somebody and you feel like that they want you to bash them down into the ground. They want you to do that because that's what they deserve for being wrong. And I guess that's how some people think is that everybody has, everybody should listen to me and what I have to say because I'm right about everything. And if everybody would just listen to me, then we wouldn't have a problem. And believe it or not, there are people in this world who live their life exactly that way. Everybody's wrong except them. And then everybody wants to bow down to them because they're the only ones that are right. Okay. And I don't go for that stuff. That's nonsense. Let God be true. And every man a liar. The only real truth you're going to find in this world is God Almighty. Okay. And while you may think everybody wants to hear what you have to say, the truth is everybody needs to hear what God has to say about it. So when it comes to wrath, who has, who is the only person who has the right to carry out their wrath? God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God said, I will repay. I'll do it. And I have found that if you let God take care of it, God will do it far better than you do. God is a lot better convincer of man than you are. And it's just better that way. But all of these are things that drive people apart. Strifes. Again, there's somebody always wanting to pick a fight. Always wanting to... Have things their way. Always trying to jockey for position. There's, there's always fighting in their life. Go, they're not happy unless they're into it with somebody. Backbitings. Explain that one to me. What is backbiting? That's the opposite of front biting. Okay? Strife and wrath is front biting. That's going right to them. Backbiters are the people that you really got to watch for because they'll, they'll smile to you and act friendly to you. But then when they get away from you and get around others, they're going to cut you down seriously. They're going to belittle you. They're going to, they're going to gossip about you. They're going to drag you down in front of others and Got no use for that one either. Whisperings is related to backbitings. You have whisperers all the time. And people who like to... Facebook is one of the places they do it. Comment section on social media is another area where people like to do it. And what gets me is with the way social media works... 
people can put up a false identity online. You never know who they are. And that empowers some people to say whatever it is that they feel like they want to say or say about you or somebody else, whatever they feel like they want to say, because they're hiding behind a false identity. If you don't like something about me, I would much, I have greater respect for you if you said it to me rather than said it about me. Does that make sense? Say it to me. Instead of, now, sometimes I'm not sure that I want to hear that one. But anyway, it's better if you say it to me. There's a, there's a way to do this. Jesus said, if we have somebody in our life that we know has done something wrong or we suspect has done something wrong, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go to them. How? Privately. When Jesus met Nicodemus, did he undress him in front of everybody and strip him down to try to embarrass him about his sin, about his life, about his religion? No, he went to him privately, went to him one on one. The intention that Jesus was trying to get here was to get Nicodemus to realize that there's only one way to God, and that is to be born again. And so that's God's way. And so Jesus said, if you sin among you sin, let, and Paul said this in Galatians. Uh, you know, bear ye one another's burdens. Go to that person. Go to them privately. And talk to them about that. With the object of restoration, not wrath. Not wrath. Not uh, I'm here because I think you did something wrong. And if, if at the end of this conversation, I feel like you've done something wrong, then I'm going to punish you severely for it. That's not what he said. He said, you go to them, deal with it privately and try to restore them. If they repent, you've gained a brother. I mean, look around you. We could use some more brethren and sister and sis, sister, sisters here. We could use some more. Amen? But what happens is we backbite, we gossip, we try to destroy them around themselves and tear them down and then wonder why they don't come to church anymore. Backbitings, whisperings, swellings. I like this one. It's when you eat too much salt, right? You swell. What is swelling? Huh? Puffed up. Knowledge puffeth up, the Bible says. And that was my big deal with some of these flat earth people is they feel like they got some knowledge that nobody else has, that God selected them to be uh, the guardian, the keepers of this big secret that the earth is really flat. And once they get this knowledge, they puff themselves up above and over everybody else. And then if you don't agree with them, they don't try to work with you to try to, you know, convince you by giving you proof. They just call you names and try to destroy you and make videos about you. And I've had that done to me and so on and so on. But they get proud and arrogant and boastful. That's what swellings is. And it can be with an individual and it can be with a group of people. Like uh, a family. Whole families can be, can be full of pride because they're of a particular family and that family is superior to everybody else in town. You have families like that in just about every town in America who think they're the top people, they're the, they are the highest family order in town, they have the most money, they have the most influence, the most power, uh, their children are the brightest students. And so on and so on. And you have that kind of people in just about every community. And you have them usually in every church. And it's all about who's, you know, who's related to that family or who is in that family. You have it um, with churches. You have it with individual churches or groups of people. And I've said this many times. If we're not careful, we will let what we believe 
And we'll take that and we'll let it puff us up as if we are the selected few that God chose to give the truth to and everybody else is a dirty rat bag. Well, that's what we are. We were nothing. Absolutely nothing. Let me show you something. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. God explained it to Israel why he selected them. If you remember, the Jews, by the time Jesus showed up, the Jews were puffed up against everybody else, even though for the past 400 years or beyond that, they had been in exile. Uh, God had let, the, had, had let the Babylonians rule over them. God let the Assyrians rule over them. And now, by the time Jesus comes into the world, some of them had made it back into the area of the promised land, Jerusalem, Israel, the land of Israel. But they were still under Roman dominion. They still had Roman rule over them, but they still, they were puffed up over who they were. And when John the Baptist came along and was preaching his repentance, the Pharisees came out to hear him preach because everybody was going out to hear John the Baptist preach and they were going to confront him because they were saying, how dare you say these things? We be children unto Abraham. And you remember what John said? God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Well, that's what he did. We're the stones that he raised up. We're the people who were nothing. And, and that's what God did with Israel. God, Israel was so puffed up about who they were. They were the select people of God. They were the people who saw the miracles in the wilderness. They were the people who saw, uh, you know, and heard God's voice at Mount Sinai. The law was given to them. They were the people who saw the Red Sea parted and they ate manna for 40 years. But if you go read all those stories, every day Israel was coming up with a new reason why they were mad at God. And it was a constant fight between God and the Israelites. So they puffed themselves up. And to this day, they still do it. When I was in um, Bible college in Nashville, Tennessee, the college that I went to was, uh, it was on donated land in a pretty well-off neighborhood, suburb of Nashville, Tennessee. And it was actually right next to a Jewish synagogue. So there were quite a few Jewish, rich Jewish people that lived in that area because when the Jews go to the synagogue on Saturday, from what I understood, they walked because they couldn't go a certain distance on the Sabbath day. So in order to get to the temple, they, they all lived in that area. And uh, I was told when I first got there, that, you know, on Saturday, get up, you know, see them walking through our campus over to this synagogue. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll try to talk to them. They said, don't bother because they won't talk to you. Really? Why? We're on the same team, aren't we? Not according to them. They did not. And I did. I was nice. Hello. Good morning. And I barely got an eye from these people. They didn't look at me. They didn't talk at me. They minded their own business and walked to the synagogue and walked back home. And you didn't get, they didn't like this little Baptist college next to their temple, next to their synagogue. They're puffed up to this day against anybody who's not a Jew. Now, here's, here's what God had already said to them back in Deuteronomy 7. Um, in verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for the few were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments 
to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. So, you know, God, why did you, why did you pick the Jews? Are they the best people in the world? Well, we know they're not. I mean, you name a conspiracy and you're going to find a Jew in the midst of it somehow, some way. And I believe that. And people accuse me of being on the wrong side of Israel because don't you know that Israel, you know, the Jews, they're part of this conspiracy and part of that conspiracy. I believe that. But they're still God's people. God chose them. God put his love on them. And you all know this. How do you help who you love? When you love somebody, there's no reasoning to it. You just love them. And that's what God was telling Israel. I didn't choose you because you were the most people in the world or you were the best people in the world. I chose you because I loved you. I loved your father Abraham. I loved Isaac. I loved Jacob. And I love you too. So God did not pick us who believe his word because we're the most moral people. We all know that's not true. He did not pick us because we were the most intelligent people in the world. That's not true either. I struggled with Algebra 1 in high school. Did not do well with it had it not been for I knew a little computer and so I took Algebra 1. And after that I wanted nothing to do with it. And there are just some concepts, higher thinking that goes along with geometry, trigonometry, calculus, algorithms. I have no idea what any of that means. And I don't think I ever will learn it in this lifetime. So I'm not the smartest person in the world. But for some reason, God loved me. And I'm thankful for that. So no swellings. No swellings. We don't, we don't, get, we don't get that opportunity. God won't let you swell up with pride. Because God then will either remind you of what you have done. Or if it's bad enough, he'll turn you back over to it for a while. To bring you back down to where you need to be. Why do you think Paul had a thorn in his flesh? Because the swellings. The thorn will pop the flesh so all the swelling oozes out. Amen. Then he said tumults. Okay. Uh, some people just like life chaos. They like disorder. Huh? Drama. Everything's got to be waves. Dissonance. Okay? That's what they like. I mean, take a listen to some of the music that some people like. And I'm talking this death metal stuff where they scream real loud and throw their guitars across the stage. And I'm just going, that's not music. Okay? But they like that. They get a kick out of that. Why? Tumults. That's, their, that's the spirit that's in them. It's a tumultuous, wavy, thrashing spirit. And so Paul says, and by the way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those, but we're not done. Verse 21, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of thee. And then he's going to mention three more. Uncleanness. Fornication. Lasciviousness. Now, look at that first list. Back in verse 20. Debates, envyings, rash, drives, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. Some people might characterize those as little sins. I mean, let's be honest. Th that kind of stuff goes on almost every day. With somebody, there's always one of these going on. But if, if it's found out then that somebody was guilty of adultery or fornication or they got caught with their pornography or whatever, or they got caught telling dirty jokes and so on, Everybody would raise a big, oh, that's a, that's a sin we've got to deal with. 
I don't see a difference. Paul's mentioning all of these all together. And I had heard this saying, I don't know if you heard this or not, you know, in years listening to preachers preach. When they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus. And they wanted Jesus then to pass judgment. Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him first cast the stone. Well, I'd heard sermons from people. And so I actually, for a while, years ago, I parroted this. I, I repeated what they said. Where they, Jesus, yeah, the original Greek says, he who is without this sin, let him first cast the stone. Oh, well, if it's only this sin, then if they're guilty of other sins, then I guess they could pass the, they could throw a stone at her. And I never stopped to think that, number one, the Bible doesn't actually say that, number one. And number two, Jesus was making a clear difference between who's righteous and who isn't. And he's not saying, well, this sin here, I mean, that's a really bad sin. And obviously, we're going to have to deal with that. But all these other little sins, people, people do that all the time. That's not a big deal. God doesn't see it that way. So whether you're guilty of adultery or having an unclean web browser or you have lasciviousness in your mind or your heart or you're secretly lusting after somebody in the church or your neighbor or somebody you work with or you've actually committed adultery, whether it's that or whether you just like to argue with everybody and can't seem to keep your mouth shut all the time. God doesn't see the difference. If you break the law in one point, you're guilty of all, God said. Because when he judges sinners at the end of their life, there may be somebody who stands before God who could say, I was faithful to my wife for 40 years and never, never looked at another woman. They might be able to say that. But the, does that mean then that they can go to heaven because they did have all these other sins in their life, in their background? When Buster Montgomery came to us years ago, and we just fell in love with this man. He just seemed to be a decent man. And his wife, sweetest woman we've ever met. And we just thought he was a good guy. 77 years old. World War II veteran. I mean, I love the guy. But he came to me after about a year and a half of coming to church here. He came to me and asked me, I don't know if I'm going to heaven or not. The man had never been saved. And as good as he was, he realized he was lost and he was going to face the wrath of God. And God's all about timing. I get that. He was saved there in his house. I baptized him here. And it wasn't a year later that we did his funeral. Because he found out he had cancer. His cancer had come back on him right after that. But it doesn't matter how the world sees how good you are. If you're guilty. And so if we count them all up here, there's 11 things here. And 11, that number always speaks of confusion. Always. It's based on confusion. Things that are 11 are always confused. Genesis 11 is when God confused the languages. When Hyun Mi and I were talking in my office, she came by the other day. As she was talking, her English is good, but she has a Korean accent. And so some of the words I had to ask her, can you repeat that back to me again? Because she didn't understand, I didn't understand some things she was saying. When Michael talks to me every now and then, does Michael say that again? And he says it again, he slows down, then I can understand it. And I said, God did a really good job of confusing the languages. Because not only, the, even, even people from England that speak, sometimes we go, what did he just say? It's English, right? But they say it differently. And so God sent confusion down to this world as a curse, as a judgment. And what happens is when anybody is guilty of these things, it automatically brings confusion. You might be in a situation where things just don't make sense. 
and you don't know exactly what it is, but what it is is a confusing spirit. I've seen that spirit at work. I've seen, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but I was preaching a service one time where a lesbian and her girlfriend came to the service and as soon as I started preaching, the whole service got disrupted. For like two and a half hours, that service got disrupted. It was down at youth camp. And there was all of a sudden now, there's a missing child and nobody knows where it is. And it almost destroyed that whole night. A confusing, chaotic spirit loves to get in. And bring discord into a congregation, into a family, into a home, into a nation. We're not, we're not in this country. We're not, if you look at days gone by, even in politics, those who were Republican and Democrat, they seemed to get along after their debates were over with. Now, we're sharply divided in this country. And it's almost like the two sides hate each other. Okay, the devil knows if he can get everybody at each other's throat and get us accusing one another, biting one another, trying to destroy one another. He knows then that he can tear this place apart. And I've seen it recently here. Recently. Okay, trying to get me out trying to destroy this church right out from underneath me. And it scares me when that happens. I mean, I get literally frightened that everything we've worked to build could be gone just like that. Always be aware. When, I don't know how to explain it, always be aware that there are enemies that hate us, hate you, hate your family, hate your church. Always be aware of that. And they will always try to get us divided asunder. Amen? What happens if you've got six logs on the fire and all of them are burning red hot? But one of those logs is taken and set aside. What happens to that log? It's going to go out. Yes, Mike, or uh, Dave, yeah, Jim, Bob, Fred. Uh, yeah, that's all right. Huh? They try to separate the weak one out from the rest of the herd. Listen, I watch these lions. Okay. Kruger National Park, you got to watch Rob the Ranger. He'll show you how the lions will go after the weakest one in a herd of buffalo. Because buffaloes, when they get together, they scare the lion. Lions don't like a herd of buffaloes standing there staring at them. Okay? But if they can get one of them separated from the group, it's dead. So you think about that next time somebody said something, did something, and the devil's trying to sow discord in you saying... See what so-and-so did? See what so-and-so said? They're like this. You don't need to be any part of that. Man, I've had that happen I don't know how many times. Some people have stayed. Some people haven't. Okay? And I'm just telling you, that's the devil's biggest weapon against us. Is not taking this Bible away from us. Getting us to hate one another. And Jesus said, they shall know you by your love for one another. Amen? Uh, somebody suggested... Uh, we get done with 2 Corinthians, and I'm going to do this for a while. I'm going to teach about the love of God. Tremendous, tremendous lessons when you understand just how much God loves sinners. It'll, you'll get it, all right? That's what God was saying to Israel in Deuteronomy 7. It, I, I, I chose it because I just loved you. And God's put up with Israel for thousands of years now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for putting up with us. God, we're nothing. And when you found us, God, you found us in a mess that we made. 
Our lives were so full of sin. We believed the devil's lies. We fell for it. He came to destroy each and every one of us. But God, I'm thank you that you found us ruined, destroyed, broken people. And Father, we thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. Help us, dear God, because you, you actually placed your forgiveness of our sins hinges on our forgiveness of other people's sins. Father, help us to remember that. Help us to love one another and understand, God, that we're not all going to do the same thing. We're not going to see things the same way. We're not all going to like what everybody else likes. And Father, give us love and patience with one another. Care for one another. Give us good fellowship here in this church. God, I have, I have so many enemies. And so many people that I thought were my friends. And God, I don't want to lose my friends here or any of my family. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just put love in our hearts for one another. Help us to be a blessing to people. Help us to be a blessing to this precious family that comes to us from Korea. Help us, dear God, to love them. Help them to love us. Father, we just ask for your forgiveness and for your grace manifested in our lives. Bless our fellowship. Bless your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.